Hey guys, welcome back. Here we are with Introduction to Sociology with Dr. John. And uh, today we're going to be discussing, uh, in the second part of our course, uh, culture. So in this section we're going to be talking about the major uh, concepts in sociology. Culture is one of the uh, first ones. So think about this. Imagine you fell asleep in August of 2018 and didn't wake up until the next year. Groggily, you get dressed, you go to school. You notice something strange. Everyone's wearing a mask. You can't see their faces. Who is who? What are they thinking? Are they sad? Happy? Serious? Are they laughing at you? You get to school, everyone has a mask. You can't even tell the teacher from the students. Not only that, but everyone's looking at you as if you are a freak. What is normal? We tend to think of, of the normal as something universal, something everybody shares. We just assume that what's normal for us is normal for everybody else. And somehow we also assume that what's normal for us today has always been normal. It's always, this has always been true. Even though we know from when we look at historical movies that people did behave differently in other cultures. So even though that is true, we assume that basic things stay the same. This is not true. Norms can and do change regularly, and so do our values, which is our basic ideas of what is important. Consider this. Most people are now doing something they would never have dreamed of doing at another time. I'm talking about due to COVID, covering their face, not greeting people, not getting close to other people, not crowding other people. Um, wearing masks in itself is something we normally associate with bandits and thieves, and now it's become not only universal, but in many places required. It's, and, and think about it, we look at people's faces to get an idea of who they are. Is this person friendly? Is this person a threat? Is this person dangerous? Is he smiling? Is he frowning? I know I've, I've walked into situations with a mask on and I'll be greeting them and smiling and I don't realize they can't see my smile. Sometimes they don't even know who I am. So I'm greeting them as though we're old friends, which we may be, and they're looking at me as like, who are you? Other things happened. Uh, many cities and regions, people stopped work for months. They stayed home, they didn't go out, they didn't go to meet their families, their friends. There was a lot of economic disruption. Things we take for granted, like, or used to take for granted, like going to parties or, or dancing close to people, going to restaurants, bars, movie theaters, going on holidays, all of these things were canceled. So how did this happen? Well, as we know, because of the coronavirus, there was a reaction, maybe an overreaction. But the process was not automatic. It had to be put in place. There had to be changes made in terms of people's ideas and their mentality. Was it maybe a conspiracy of doctors and scientists hoping to boost their status? Was it a, a conspiracy of government officials hoping to increase their power? Was it wealthy people trying to concentrate their wealth? Now, I'm sure you've heard conspiracy theories of this sort, but these things are unlikely. The process, though, did spur a lot of conspiracy theories and even a whole movement of people who refused to participate. People stood up for their right not to wear a mask in public. Some politicians and religious groups use these changes to appeal for wider support casting doubt on science. So this makes us think about what is it that makes up the culture, the belief system, the values are, that, that exist around us. We understand culture to be the common understandings of a group of people learned through patterns of thinking, feeling, and acting. 
And normally we think of culture as something on a societal level. But everybody in a given society shares certain common values and norms of behavior. Typically, these norms and values are, are built on tradition. They come from the past. They're things we've inherited. But as we see with coronavirus, they can change. And they can change sometimes fairly rapidly. There are two, two aspects to culture. There's material culture. That's physical objects, artifacts, things that people make. Now, why do we consider these a part of culture, like the automobile? Because as an artifact, first of all, it reflects things we put our values into. If we didn't value automobiles, we wouldn't be willing to spend so much of our time paying for them, right? So we, we value them literally in the sense that we put our time and energy in the form of money into these things. Uh, other things that, we, that are part of our culture uh, are material culture like books, like records, uh, the whole music industry, in a certain sense, is a material culture, as well as a non-material culture, the songs and so on and so forth. Non-material culture refers to that more abstract aspects of culture, things like our, our values. Values are things that we believe in strongly enough to invest in. We, we spend our time, we, we give them importance. Beliefs could be including our religion, our belief in objectivity, perhaps on the one hand, or our belief in science, uh, or our belief in progress, our belief in individuality. Um, another thing is norms. Norms are the more everyday expected roles or, or behaviors that we be, uh, that we participate in, such as, on the one hand, driving on one side of the street. Right? Imagine if everybody just drove down the street any way they wanted to, you'd have a lot of accidents. So the norm in America of driving on the right hand of the, of the road, in England of driving on the left hand of the road, it doesn't matter as long as everybody follows the same norm. Uh, norms also of politeness, of courtesy, and you think about norms, for example, how we converse with other people, there are ways we let them know, usually when we finish speaking or when we're expecting them to speak or ways that we encourage people to speak. These are all part of normative behavior. Um, the norms of how we're expected to behave in society, uh, such as not taking things that don't belong to us. Uh, again, these are all ways in which by participating in the same norms, we can understand each other. Now, norms, of course, and values, our culture as a whole, is affected by our needs as a, as a, as a people, as a society, and as individuals. It's also affected by our environment. People who live in very arid uh, environments will have a culture that is used to not having water, to preserving water, safeguarding water, um, treating water as something very valuable. Uh, other cultures where it's very cold, you're going to have norms and values, uh, warm buildings, uh, lots of clothes, and things like that to keep you warm. So the, there is a relationship with our environment. There's also a relationship with history and a social sense of being so that our norms and values help us to recognize other people who are from the same culture as we are. Society. Now, society refers in the broadest sense to a group of people who live in the same territory and share the same culture. Generally, society is defined by the amount of interaction between people. Um, culture is defined by the mechanisms of interaction. So, for example, language is a very important part of any culture. The, the shared language and the symbols, the, the words, the meanings, the jokes, the, the, the sayings, all of these are part of a given culture and may mean something quite different in a different culture. 
generally the idea of culture is to facilitate understanding between people who live in the same society so that they can interact on a regular basis, hopefully without uh, confusion. So to give you an example, when let's say two people meet, uh, they might talk a lot because they have to get to know each other. Even if they're from the same culture, there's going to be a lot of differences. Over time, as they get to know each other, they don't need to speak as much because they know each other. So they, uh, one, one word can let the other person know a whole realm of meaning. Norms are those social rules that define appropriate and inappropriate behavior, generally specific to the circumstances or the situation. Norms are not just moral rules, but rules of interaction. So, for example, how you address a professor as opposed to a friend. You wouldn't normally go up to a professor and say, hey, how you doing? Right? You would you would treat them with hopefully some some amount of respect. Whereas with a friend, you can of course treat them as you like because they're your friend. They're on the same level as you. There are norms about buying merchandise. Um, for example, when you buy a used car, you haggle. But when you go go to a supermarket and you buy a can of food, you normally don't haggle. You just pay the price, uh, or you go somewhere else to find a cheaper price. There are different types, uh, or you could say levels, of norms. So some norms uh, we call folkways. These are just, folk means people in general. So folkways are specific rules about daily activity, what you might call etiquette, how we are expected to behave, to be seen as a polite, normal, responsible member of society. Uh, take, for example, lining up to get on a bus. You go to the bus stop, you form a line. When the bus comes, you, in uh, according to your position in line, you get on the bus. Right? That's one way of doing it. Uh, I believe in America we tend to do that. Other places in the world, they just crowd around and whoever's closest to the door jumps on board. Right? It's a system. It's also a folkway. If you were to go to, let's say, England, and you expect there to be a line, you, you might be disappointed. Uh, on the other hand, if you go to America and you push your way in front of everybody else, you might look around and see everybody staring at you as if you just dropped out of space. So people who violate folkways are typically seen as different. There usually isn't a harsh punishment, though. Uh, these, these rules are not generally written down so that if somebody violates them, people usually look at them as rude or maybe oh, maybe he doesn't understand. You might say he's a foreigner, he doesn't know our way of doing things. Of course, if they persist, then we might say that there's something wrong with them. So we expect people to adapt to our folkways as when we go to a foreign country. Again, we usually look at other people to see how we're expected to behave. We, we, had, we try, or at least hopefully, try to adapt their folkways so we don't stand out and, and seem rude to the people there. Now, mores, it's called, it's spelt mores, but we pronounce it mores. <laughs> These are more important norms that reflect a moral value. Uh, so people who violate the mores are often seen as immoral or sinful and may receive harsh punishment. Uh, many mores may in fact be formalized as rules by whatever system of government uh, you have at the time. So rules generally formalize mores. So things like not stealing, that's a lot more important than a folk way. If somebody takes money out of your pocket, they're not just being rude. We consider that violating a more. You're not supposed to steal, right? And we normally, in most societies, have rules against this. In fact, some of the oldest laws of society are rules against stealing, things like stealing, adultery, um, killing, murder. 
right? So these are very important because they're considered core values. If we have, if we are allowed to go around killing people left, right, and center, society would fall apart. We would not be able to trust each other. If people steal from each other all the time, then we would not feel secure in our possessions. Again, we would be insecure. So this is why we value these things much more highly. And like I said, generally most mores are turned into laws when you have uh, get to the level of civilization. Now there's another norm called a taboo. A taboo is an activity that is considered so abhorrent that Sometimes we don't even have rules against it. Uh, think about, for example, eating dogs. There's no law against eating dogs. It's not prohibited uh, by the, uh, by, for example, at least Christian uh, religion. Uh, but uh, we don't eat dogs. We don't eat cats. We don't eat horses. We don't eat chimpanzees. In fact, we don't eat anything that falls into a certain class of animal that we consider pets. Right? So we think of pets, dogs, cats, horses, as somehow extensions of our human family. So we don't eat them, at least not in, in Western society or not in most Western society. I understand in France and some other countries, maybe they eat, they eat horses. Uh, some places in the Far East, they may eat dogs or cats, right? They don't have taboos against it. The point is the taboo is just another norm. We just have a norm against eating those things. However, we have no problem eating goats or pigs or uh, cows, whereas other cultures have very specific uh, taboos against, for example, Jews and Muslims against eating pork, Hindus against eating beef. So cultures tend to pick certain things that they relate to. And normally a taboo is something that is considered sacred. It is reserved for the gods. So one of the most uh, universal taboos, although not completely universal, is the rule about cannibalism. But where cannibalism is practiced, it's generally practiced as part of a specific religious ritual. People don't just eat other people. It's a part of religious symbolism. So, it, again, it's a part of the taboo. You don't normally do it, but you might do it under specific ritual circumstances. So, these are the four different types of norms we generally have in society. So let's just do a quick review. Here you've got the four different types of norms, and uh, we'll just go through them all. If you want to pause first, take a pause and write down what you think each one of these things is, and then we'll go through them all. Um, so pause. Okay, so I'm assuming either you paused or you didn't pause. <coughs> so let's go through these examples. Interrupting somebody who is speaking. Well, normally this would be considered a folk way. It's considered rude to interrupt somebody. However, it might be there are certain circumstances, so for example, if somebody very important is given a speech and you interrupt it, that might be more of a moray. Stealing money from your job. Well, that would obviously be a moray or a law that you're violating. Well, actually it'd be a law. Uh, but first a moray and then a law. Incest. Now, in uh, most places, incest is against the law, but before that, it's either a moray or in some places considered a taboo. So a taboo is something that you, you think of as so horrible, you don't even want to discuss it or even consider it. However, incest, <clears throat> particularly ritual incest, was practiced, again, by certain peoples, uh, for example, uh, the pharaohs in Egypt. And again, it was tied into the notion that they were gods and therefore were exempt to regular human rules and so forth. Four, speeding. Now, speeding, that means going over the speed limit. So it's against the law, but is it a moray? Uh, a lot of people speed. In fact, you'd almost consider it's become 
a norm in American society. Uh, in America, a lot of people think that if you drive five or ten miles over the speed limit, that's okay. Uh, believe me, if the police stop you, they will. They can give you a ticket, and you can't say, as I've heard people say in court, well, I was only driving ten miles over the speed limit. That's okay, isn't it? <laughs> no. Um, that's not okay. The law says you're supposed to drive at 55 or 65 or 45, whatever the posted limit is. But think about somebody who, who drives recklessly, let's say driving outside a school at 65 miles an hour when there are kids around, people would consider that a more right. They're violating a more right because they're not just speeding, but they're putting the lives of children at risk. In American society, we tend to value children very, very highly. Cheating on a test. Hmm, that's, a, that's a good one. Now, I'm a teacher, so I would say, oh, that's a moray. That's pretty serious because it violates the value of academic integrity. You're, <clears throat> when you're cheating, you're only cheating yourself. <laughs> Remember that. But some people consider, you know, uh, you know, letting their friends see their answers as kind of like almost normal behavior. No, in fact, they might consider it rude if your friend didn't share their answers with you. I hope you don't agree with that. Um, but anyway, they, it could depend on the circumstance and, and who you're talking to at the moment. Um, cheating on your girlfriend, boyfriend. Again, this would definitely be considered uh, probably buy your girlfriend and bo boyfriend a more. They would say this is serious. This means you don't value our relationship. You don't care about me, etc., etc. Um, other people it may be uh, uh, maybe consider it more of a folk way that it's not nice, but uh, it's their way of living. I don't know. If you want to live with those kind of people, it's up to you, I guess. Number seven, dropping a cluster bomb in a village. Well, that sounds pretty pretty severe, but you might be ordered to drop a cluster bomb on a village if you work for the uh, U.S. Air Force or some other air force, and that village is designated an enemy target, and you are ordered to drop a bomb on it. So normally we consider this to kill people. We consider a moray, but there's a lot of circumstances in which killing people becomes not becomes a part of your job description, frankly. So one point I'm making here is when we talk about norms, norms are always situational. It depends on the situation you're in. They're also culturally determined. It depends on the culture. Uh, it may be, for example, interrupting someone. In some cultures, if you're the more powerful person, you expect to interrupt other people. And they, they don't consider that rude because you're, you're the powerful person. Um, in American society, we don't like to impose or, or uh, we like to think everybody's equal, so we tend to consider it rude. Uh, but men tend to interrupt women a lot more than the other way around. So again, this is a power dynamic. Adults interrupt children. right? So again, power dynamics play into these things uh, as well as other types of dynamics. There's an interesting story uh, about uh, a plane of people. It was called uh, Flight 571. And uh, the on the plane was a football team. They were traveling from uh, Uruguay to uh, Chile. And the plane crashed in the Andes. And the, they couldn't be found because the plane was covered by snow. And so you had all these people who survived the crash but they had nothing to eat, literally nothing to eat besides a few candy bars. And somehow they survived 71 days. How did they do it? 13 people survived basically by eating the others. Now, they didn't just say, oh, let's start eating, I'm hungry, let's chew down on Mr. Valdez. No, it was difficult because of course, they were all from cultures where uh, cannibalism is considered taboo. It's considered one of the worst taboos, as it, as it were. Um, and so it didn't, it wasn't like they made the choice easily. It was a very difficult choice. What was very interesting about the case 
is that they made a, they had a group discussion and a group decision. When it became apparent, uh, pretty much to everybody, that they were all going to starve to death, some of them said, "Look, we have an obligation to survive. Uh, we have an obligation to live. We have loved ones waiting for us. We shouldn't just sit here and die. There is an option." We can eat the people who died. And very often they used value systems from their previous life. Well, their life, they were Catholics for the most part. So they used the concepts of communion. Communion in Catholicism, you, uh, whether you, you believe it or not, figuratively or literally, eat the body of Christ. So they turn that around to say we're, we're surviving by eating our fellow uh, passengers. Some of them were our friends. And this is a sacrifice. So this, these friends died. Let's not make their death uh, useless. They died as a sacrifice. Some, in some of the cases, the people dying did, in fact, agree to be eaten. But, of course, most of the people they ate had already died in the crash. The other, the other uh, value they used was the value of survival, and not just for them individually, but for their, their families, their loved ones, that they had an obligation to go back to their loved ones. And notice, when people talk about values, it's not about personal value, uh, you know, what's important to me. The values are shared values. Values can only be justified socially, right? So they had, they couldn't just say, I want to survive. They had to justify it in terms of, uh, I need to survive so that my loved ones will see me again. Um, and choice. They gave people the choice. And some people chose not to do it, and they did starve to death. Um, everybody who chose not to uh, revert to cannibalism, starve to death. Of course, it was 71 days, and there's no way you can live without food for 71 days. It's, it's absolutely impossible. So the only way these people survived was through cannibalism. And they also adopted a series of norms. So, for example, they rationed the meat. They only used certain parts of the body at first, uh, and then other parts of the body, like the inner organs and the brains, were kind of left open, so those were not rationed. People could eat them uh, if they wanted extras, if they could stomach it, basically. That was the, that was the thing. And then people, uh, when they assigned for people to go and look for help, which eventually they did do, um, they, those people were given extra rations. Now, another, another interesting aspect to value systems is, of course, they were doing this at the same time they knew that when they were going to come back to society, there was a huge fear that what they had done would create a, a massive rejection by society towards them. And there was, uh, there was a certain level of rejection. At first, everybody's like, wow, these people survived, what a miracle. And then when people started to hear, hold it, they survived by cannibalism uh, uh, it, it disgusted a lot of people frankly until kind of like there was a there, there was a social bomb it was like well how else would they have survived so in in a sense they were welcomed back in society and accepted back and their as it were their sins what they had done their sins their taboo was forgiven by society as a whole. Uh, although, I don't know about you, but I, I might be a little nervous. <laughs> I'm just joking. But imagine you spend the night with one of these people. It's like, well, what if they get hungry in the middle of the night and, and they, can't, they can't find any food? They might eat me. Um, that would be a, that's a terrible joke to make. Because these people were in a very real situation. They could have chosen to have just died. Um, but I think the, the, the society's reaction to them was that they accepted it. This was considered uh, an extraordinary situation in which uh, it, the, the violation of this taboo 
was something that, that could be justified. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, wait to see you next time. Go ahead and watch the video about the Flight 571 and read the companion. You have a good day.